Hi, welcome. We're going to talk about parameter types. So these are the topics we're going to cover. In this first video, we're going to look at the motivation for having parameter types in Julia, as well as what a parameter type is. And next, after that, there's going to be a video on generic collections, which is using parameter types for defining a collection. And then I'm going to cover common pitfalls or gotchas when you're using parametric types. So basically things you might misunderstand or go wrong. And then finally we're going to revisit the nullable type, which is what allows us to use null or simulate that we have null or nil in, in the Julia programming language. And this is because it's implemented using parametric types. So let's continue this first video where we're going to we're asking the question why do we have parametric types in Julia and what are they so first we're going to look at a definition of parametric types uh, how we use them and the motivation for having them in a dynamic script language like Julia because normally parametric types would be used in a statically typed language like C++ or Java then we're going to continue with looking at some examples of usage. So first, what is a parameter type? Well, it's a type that takes parameters. And these parameters, they could be either be other types, or they could really be anything. It could be a number, for instance, which is what we're going to look at in the next video in one of the examples. And parameter types is something that allows us to do generic programming. This is a term that was coined by the creator of the standard temple library, Alexander Stefanov. And it makes sense for statically typed languages because it allows us to create algorithms and data structures without being specifying the types they're operating on exactly so that you can reuse your code for, for different types. So here's an example of a parameter type. Uh, you might remember that I defined point in an earlier video, but in that case the coordinates were 64-bit integers. And in this case we're saying that we don't really know what the coordinates are. There are some type t that has yet to be specified, but there are some constraints. We're saying that the x and the y, whatever the type is, they have to be the same. So one way of creating such a point is putting between the curly braces what the type parameter t should be. So this is creating a concrete type or an instance of the primary type. Of course, a problem with how we define it is that we could define a point in this manner as well, which means that we're having the coordinates being characters which obviously doesn't make any sense. So we want to have further constraints. So this is one way of doing that, which is using the Julia subtype operator, which in this case, we're using it to state that whatever the type T is, we want it to be a subtype of the abstract type number. Now, another way of using this, uh, we can use it also for algorithms or functions. So in this case, this is kind of how we would typically implement something like push, where we're saying that whatever the data types or the elements of a vector is, some type T, we want the item that we're adding to it to also be of that same type. Now, this is really mainly for demonstration purposes. In Julia itself, in the standard library, the items would typically be of any type, and Julia will do some kind of type conversion. Uh, that's handy if you want to add, for instance, an integer number to a vector of floating point numbers. Now you might ask, why don't we just use abstract types in this case? For instance, define a type in this manner where we're saying that the x and the y is just some number. Well, one of the obvious problems here is that there are no constraints between x and y. Uh, and x could be a 64-bit integer and the y could be say a floating point number. And the same goes for if we're defining a function, we can have a generic function vector that takes some item 
they could be of any type. You could, of course, do it this way, but um, we wouldn't be able to constrain the, the types that we are uh, adding. But this isn't really the reason why Julia has type parameters. It's much more important, actually, is performance considerations, because performance is one of the main reasons for creating Julia in the first place. In a regular script language like Python, Ruby, or JavaScript, you will often have memory organized in this kind of fragmented manner, where these first three elements in green here represents elements in an array. But because these languages, the just-in-time compiler can't really know how large each element is, it's going to store in each position a pointer to the element rather than the element itself, and then you can point to an element of arbitrary size. This isn't very efficient for a number of reasons, because it means you will require multiple memory reads to actually get the elements. And if you're looping over and, say, performing an addition of integers, there's no way for the compiler to know that. It will have to check in every case what exactly the type is. So this is not going to be very efficient. What Julia is aiming for is having all the data you're operating on in contiguous memory. So by that, I mean that every element is adjacent to the next element. And that's possible in Julia because you cannot have subtypes of concrete types in Julia. So that means that once you specify a concrete type when creating an array, the JIT compiler will know exactly the number of bytes required for each element and can allocate that so that each element can be placed next to each other. So that was some of the reasons performance wise. I'm going to jump over to a slightly different topic now uh, and let you consider the notion of subsets. We hadn't talked about this really before, but subtypes in Julia are really can be thought of as subsets. So a type such as number could be viewed as the set of all number types, integer, floating point, uh, 8-bit integers, 16-bit six, integers, and so on. These are just all types within the number set. And then a real number, for instance, would be some subset of number containing certain numbers and excluding others. And it works in the similar fashion for parametric types. So here we have a parametric type in green called A taking the type parameter T. And the parameter type taking an int 8 or a floating point 64 would just be a subset of this. So the way we can express this in Julia is to say using the subset operator, and we can say that a point containing integer coordinates is a subset of points where t has yet to be defined. That basically means t is anything. A shorthand for writing this is to just simply exclude the t part. And that means that it can vary. It could be um, anything. If these are functions that we're defining for our points, because we're not specifying the the type parameter, it means it can be anything. So it means that P and Q could be any kind of point. It could be a point with uh, floating point coordinates or integer coordinates. So one way of expressing this explicitly, what we're doing here, is to introduce two type parameters to T and S, and then P, when it, we're using T for that one, and S for Q, because they can vary independently of each other. They're not constrained to be equal. Here's an example of how you can create a point by explicitly stating that type parameter, uh, this is a floating point, an integer, and we can also infer that by giving to integers, Julie can figure out that the type parameter is in 64-bit integer. Uh, 
uh, if we're getting floating points, it will figure out that it's the type parameter is floating point. Now we define these two uh, p and q, and if we do a minimum of these, we're getting uh, a point with in 64. In this case, we get a point with float 64. So you can see that we're returning different types, and that's not always desirable. Often you would want to constrain the, the type arguments. And one way of doing this is just to define a one type parameter, t in this case. And because we're providing that both for t and q, it states that whatever the t is, it has to be the same for both p and q. So if we revisit our example again and create the p and q as different types, if we're trying to call minimum of p and q, you're going to get an error message because we're trying to use two different types for p and q, and likewise for max. So let's uh, summarize this. Parameter types in Julia is primarily for performance, but it also helps with correctness even though it's not going to provide the same kind of correctness as for a statically typed code where you can catch problems at compile time. For Julia, you're still going to have these problems at runtime, but you're going to get the failure a bit earlier. And one thing I think is worth remembering is that you can look at instances of parametric types as subtypes of that parametric type. So keep that in type if you're seeing just point or vector or something it just means uh, a vector with any type in it or a point with any coordinates